Happy Yojo June and the 60th anniversary of G.I. Joe. So for that occasion, let's talk about how to watch every G.I. Joe series and movie. It's Morphin Time! Hello, this is Sanit here, and welcome back to another viewing guide. If you haven't seen one of these before, I've done plenty on other franchises, which you can check out after this video in the wonderful playlist. But today's topic is G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe as a franchise is celebrating its 60th anniversary. It originally started as an action doll, a competitor to Barbie. The idea of you buy the one doll and then you get the accessories for that doll. Except since it was for boys, it was an action figure. And that was kind of the whole premise of original G.I. Joe. It was Barbie for boys and follow the same basic model. And over the years, G.I. Joe has come to evolve into something else. See, because the original 12-inch G.I. Joe figure is iconic, especially for the time it was created in, it sort of ended up being too expensive to produce after the oil crisis, and so in the 80s, G.I. Joe was relaunched at a 3.75-inch scale, kind of in the scale that Star Wars had made popular, with G.I. Joe a real American hero. And that line was incredibly successful for Hasbro, and they repeated the same basic formula they made there for Transformers. And what was that formula? Well, they took the G.I. Joe toys themselves, which were these three and three quarter inch figures. They made multiple characters because it couldn't just be one figure anymore with multiple accessories. They had to be more purpose built. They gave them vehicles. And then in order to kind of drive the toy line, they ended up partnering with Marvel Comics to create the G.I. Joe, a real American hero comic, which was written by Larry Hama. Terrific, terrific comic. Before we get too far in, I will say, if you want the best G.I. Joe stories, in my personal opinion, it's G.I. Joe by Larry Hama in the pages of Marvel Comics, IDW Comics, and now Skybound Comics. This started in 1982 with issue 1, and it's currently in uh, issue 305, I believe, in Skybound's years. There is an amazing amount of storytelling with the G.I. Joe characters in those comics, and it's my personal favorite version of G.I. Joe, which is Larry Hama's version of G.I. Joe. But what's really cool is that that format of, oh, let's take a comic book, then translated into, what if we made a TV show? And that's where we'll start our guide. And guess what? Transformers, which despite being, I think, the more popular brand in the long run, ended up kind of going on the back heels of G.I. Joe. They did a comic book at Marvel, they did a TV show with Marvel Productions and Sunbow, and then they would ended up moving forward. And Transformers is sort of reinvigorated, where G.I. Joe has sort of struggled, and that'll be kind of the history of the franchise as we talk about its series and movies. But that pretty much is the setup. This is the G.I. Joe franchise. It's a toy brand that has a lot of rich, beautiful stories told within it, and some very ups and downs on how those stories came to be. So we're going to go through each series by series, breaking them all down for you now. And if you enjoy this type of video, please hit the like button so that more people can go and enjoy G.I. Joe. I know everybody really loves the G.I. Joe Classified series figures. I certainly do. I have most of them. I've covered them all on the channel. It's an amazing line of 6-inch G.I. Joes that has completely reinvigorated interest in the Joe brand. But I have noticed there are a lot of people who don't know the G.I. Joe stories behind the characters, and I hope this guide helps you figure out if you want to dive into this world of G.I. Joe. And of course, hit subscribe and the notification bell if you haven't already, so you can help support the channel, keep growing, and continue doing more viewing guides like this. I've talked about Transformers a lot here. At some point, i got to do a Transformers viewing guide, so be sure to hit subscribe to make sure that happens. But now, let's begin where it all began with the Real American Hero franchise, the first on-screen story told the G.I. Joe brand, the Sunbow 1982 animated series. Joe. Joe is there. So in 1983, a five-part miniseries premiered, G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, now known as The Mass Device, parts one through five. This five-part miniseries introduced the concept of G.I. Joe versus Cobra, G.I. Joe, a special operations mission force gathered by operatives from around the world to fight the evil terrorist organization known as Cobra. It tells you everything you need to know in the intro, and that's what I love about 80s cartoons. What's really surprising about the mass device especially is I think it's a pretty solid introduction to G.I. Joe. If you've never seen G.I. Joe, if you want a baseline of the characters and the way the story is set up, go watch the mass device. If you don't continue the rest of the series, you will get the basic idea of G.I. Joe. This is what it took from what was being done in the Marvel comic that Larry Hama wrote, 
to the way that the profile cards worked out on the toys, and then expanding it into an animated format, making it a lot more creative friendly than the Larry Hama Marvel comic was. The comic kind of goes for a grittier, more, uh, you know, realistic take in a lot of ways while still having a lot of wackier sci-fi elements, whereas the cartoon naturally has people popping out a parachute as soon as their plane is shot down, and that sort of thing. So it's a lot less violent overall, and everybody uses laser guns. So it's kind of like the two different sides of G.I. Joe. You can go a little bit more grounded, more realistic, or you can go more uh, sci-fi, more kid-friendly. And what I enjoy about G.I. Joe is the fact that even the grounded, more realistic stuff can be super fun. The fun element of G.I. Joe always has to be there in order for it to really be successful in my eyes. But like I said, if you're trying to find out the basics of G.I. Joe, the mainstay characters, the Mass Device 5 part is a good way to start. So in 1984, they weren't quite committed to doing a full animated series, but they did a second miniseries, The Revenge of Cobra, another five-part episodes. Now these first two five-parters kind of get rolled in as part of season one in a lot of listings, but it's very important to know that they were standalone miniseries aired on TV. It was kind of a thing they did in the 80s. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is a similar situation where they start with a five-part sort of miniseries serial to see if there was interest there to continue the show. And what's really fun about this is that you kind of get the continuing story of G.I. Joe. Now, Revenge of Cobra was a big hit, and the two miniseries themselves proved to be successful enough to launch G.I. Joe Real American Heroes Season 1 in 1985. Lasting for 55 episodes, it kicked off with another five-parter, The Pyramid of Darkness. And this five-parter was a great introduction to the way the series was going to progress. What's really interesting about the original G.I. Joe cartoon is while you have like mainstay characters like Duke, Snake Eyes, Scarlet, Storm Shadow, Cobra Commander, Destro, Baroness, they sort of almost get downplayed almost immediately because by the time you got the cartoon, it was 1985. So the year was like three years into the toy line at that point, which means characters like Lady J or Flint sort of became more prominent G.I. Joes over Duke and Scarlet. And so I think that's kind of interesting, especially villains like Tomax and Zaymot, again, as opposed to some of the more prominent characters you see throughout the rest of media. And so I find it interesting. Now, the cool part about season one is that after that five-parter, everything becomes a lot more standalone episodic storytelling. You will get multi-parters here and there, but a lot of them are more one-off stories. And it kind of takes the format that I think works really well for G.I. Joe, which is here's a couple Joes fighting a couple Cobras, and it changes up the roster week to week. You don't exactly get the same characters every single time, but you'll see the characters kind of grow and change over time. And I think that's really, really cool to see because it does have its own sense of continuity. And I will say as well, as opposed to the Sunbow Transformers cartoon, the animation quality is really, really solid on G.I. Joe. It did seem like Marvel Productions and Sunbow were sort of banking on G.I. Joe being their big hit, and it's funny how that kind of worked out in the long run. Transformers ended up being the bigger hit overall, but G.I. Joe at the time was the bigger property, and so they kind of gave it more budget, I would say because I don't see the wild variance in animation quality the way that happened on Transformers. So honestly speaking, I think this is a great way to introduce yourself to G.I. Joe, get like a splapdash of all of the introduction of characters. And the good part too is it didn't end with that one 55 episode season, there was a season two. Now season two was in 1986, lasting for 30 episodes, beginning with another five-parter, Arise Serpentor Arise, introducing the new main villain of Serpentor, one of my favorite Cobra villains personally, and and one of the coolest characters he introduced to the G.I. Joe mythos. And the way he's introduced in the show is different than the comic, and I like the two parallels there and how they did things. Serpentor, of course, would become a mainstay villain for the next few years, though you won't know him nowadays because they never use him in anything modern. But this season two brought the series to a whopping total of 95 episodes when it ended in 1987. Now, that wouldn't be the end of that continuity, but that was the end of the series itself. And 95 episodes is a very impressive run. This is also one of the more available G.I. Joe shows. It had a DVD box set from Shout Factory, which also has individual volume releases. This current version, which is a slipcase with a bunch of smaller uh, thin pack cases inside, doesn't go for too much online. You can get it for a pretty good price. But if you're looking to stream it, it is available on Tubi, which is a free platform, which is awesome. And some episodes are streaming on the Hasbro G.I. Joe YouTube channel. It's pretty easy to find it. And like I said, I recommend watching that initial five-parter of the mass device. It'll give you like your great introduction to G.I. Joe more than anything else I can recommend today. Now, like I said, the cartoon ending did not mean the end of that continuity group. 
The 1987 G.I. Joe the movie continued the story. Now, Transformers and G.I. Joe got movies at about the same time. Though G.I. Joe was intended to go out first, I believe, Transformers ended up going to theaters, not performing super well, and having a ton of backlash over things that happened in that film. There was a lot of traumatized children. And the G.I. Joe movie had done a similar approach of transitioning to a new phase by doing certain things to some characters, and so some last-minute edits sort of fixed that up, but the movie was sent direct to video because they were not good at the theatrical box office. The Transformers movie flopped, the Care Bears movie flopped, and they were like, let's just send this thing to video. That being said, G.I. Joe the movie sort of works as a finale to the original Sunbow cartoon. Everything that had been built up during season two with Serpentor kind of comes to a head in the film. It has a really bombastic opening that is very iconic that you may have seen if you've spent any time looking at G.I. Joe stuff. It has pretty much every character that appeared in the series up to that point in the first five minutes of the movie. It's pretty incredible, uh, though some might say that the rest of the movie falls off after that opening, and yeah, that opening is pretty stellar, but I do think there's a lot of cool stuff within the film itself that shouldn't be ignored. It expands the mythos and explores more into the lore of G.I. Joe, though it has become sort of a taboo to just not reference the movie, which I'm glad to see some recent media adaptations have avoided completely. But with that said, G.I. Joe the movie is not really streaming anywhere from what I can tell, but it does have a Blu-ray and DVD release from Shout Factory, and it's pretty easily available. And honestly, I wouldn't recommend necessarily jumping into this as like your first G.I. Joe experience, but if you want something bold and bombastic, it's going to be fun. But like I said, a lot of lore and a lot of uh, storylines that kind of continue from the series. So it's a nice capstone to the Sunbow era. Now, following the movie, there was a continuation, which, officially speaking, continues the Sunbow continuity from what the movie set up. Though a lot of fans will consider this its own continuity because of how different it is. After the 87 movie, the next G.I. Joe series was G.I. Joe Real American Hero from 1989. It's the same exact title as the previous show, except this one was produced by Deke Entertainment. And if anyone knows about Deke Entertainment, they weren't known for high-quality productions. Now, it's not to take any way, anything away from the series, but it has a different art style, it has a different tone, it has a lot of different voice actors. While they do pick up plot points from G.I. Joe the movie in its opening five-parter Operation Dragonfire, personally speaking, it does feel like almost an alternate timeline in a lot of ways. So it's going to be kind of a take-it-or-leave-it depending on how you enjoy your G.I. Joe. You may want to watch Operation Dragonfire, and you may be kind of hooked on it, but for me personally, I kind of dropped off after the first couple episodes of its first season from 1990, which lasted 19 episodes. And there was a second season in 1991 lasting for 20 episodes, meaning this was a much shorter run than the original Sunbow cartoon. Personally speaking, I wouldn't jump in on this one. If you like the Sunbow cartoon and want more, give it a shot, but it may not fit your style and taste because it may not fit the style and taste of the original Sunbow series. Now, the Deke series is available from Shout Factory as G.I. Joe Real American Hero Series 2, Season 1 and 2, and it is streaming on Tubi, though I have noticed sometimes you can't find Operation Dragonfire, so keep an eye out because that is a critical part of starting that show. Situation critical. Now, shortly after the Deke series, the original G.I. Joe comic ended at issue 155, the original toy line ended shortly after, and a relaunch was planned for G.I. Joe. Much like how Transformers relaunched with Beast Wars, which really reinvigorated Transformers and has kept it running every single year since, G.I. Joe had G.I. Joe Extreme in 1995. Two seasons of 13 episodes each, this series is not fondly remembered because uh, where's the nostalgia pull? For the near-future adventures taking place in 2006, where Lieutenant Stone's G.I. Joe team fights Scar. Yeah, the G.I. Joe vs. Cobra conflict was thrown out in favor of Lieutenant Stone's G.I. Joe fighting Scar. This was a departure. I think the 2006 setting was almost to sync it up with the Transformers time skip that happens in the 86 movie. But uh, it's kind of a strange thing because it sort of sets as an outlier. Uh, it's like one of the only G.I. Joe productions where Duke isn't involved at all. It doesn't have any familiar characters like Cobra Commander. It doesn't even have Cobra. It has Scar. And so the thing is, is that I think there's a lot of disconnect. And because of that, it's kind of hard to find the show. It's out there. You can certainly find it, but it's had no official DVD release. It's had no official streaming release. You're going to have to dig for it if you really want to look for it. It's kind of a nice little relic of its time. I mean, the 
title is G.I. Joe Extreme. It is very mid-90s. But if you find it, you're going to find something different than pretty much every other G.I. Joe production out there, which is giving it its own significance as itself. And that was kind of how it was. 26 episodes, toy line was in and out, it didn't go anywhere, and they would wait a few years before trying G.I. Joe again. Now, while G.I. Joe had some comic revivals, its first major toy line revival was in 2002 with the G.I. Joe vs. Cobra line. And if you could tell by my age, uh, this is where I learned uh, G.I. Joe stuff. I was in the 2000s era, which, you know, wasn't as like the heyday of the 80s, but they certainly were pushing G.I. Joe pretty hard during this time. The 2002 G.I. Joe vs. Cobra toy line had an accompanying CG commercials by Real FX Films. These were kind of reintroducing the concept of G.I. Joe versus Cobra. And that had proved successful enough that the 2003 G.I. Joe Spy Troops toy line had a CGI tie-in movie. It was a direct-to-video film that also aired on Cartoon Network. I remember watching it on Toonami specifically. It was quite an exciting time. And the Spy Troops movie was kind of the first big G.I. Joe animated project since Extreme. And it had been many, many years at that point. What's really cool about Spy Troops is that it does feel like a good introduction to G.I. Joe. Though nowadays you're watching it, the CGI definitely has aged itself. It doesn't have that timeless quality that you think it would. But it actually was a good introduction to kids to G.I. Joe in the early 2000s. They didn't quite fully commit to anything yet, but they had a movie out that was available. It was even packed in with some of the toys, which was pretty cool. Now, if you're looking for Spy Troops nowadays, it's not officially streaming, and it hasn't had an official DVD release since that one from 21 years ago. Age gets us all, but the uh, the movie is easily found out there if you have the will and the energy to look for it. It's out there. Uh, it's pretty well available, but not any current releases. Now, in 2004, the same formula was followed with the G.I. Joe Valor vs. Venom toy line. See, the G.I. Joe line was getting new names every year like Transformers was. There was another direct-to-video CG film that also aired on Cartoon Network. This one was a little bit higher budget, I think. I even noticed as a kid, I was like, oh, this is... This is a little bit more, uh, there's more into it. And what I really like about it is that it actually has like a new storyline with the whole Venom side of Cobra. And the Valor vs. Venom movie was a sequel to Spy Troops, continued that continuity, and it featured, of course, that year's toys as prominent characters. Much like Spy Troops, it's not too hard to find out there, but it's not officially streaming nor officially on a currently in-print DVD. Now, the next big relaunch for G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe Sigma-6, is actually a sequel to Valor vs. Venom. The toy line itself wasn't quite the same thing. Uh, Spy Troops, G.I. Joe vs. Cobra, Valor vs. Venom, they're all three and three quarter inch. Sigma-6 bumped them up to eight inch figures with these armor parts, and it was kind of a departure for a lot of people, and a lot of longtime G.I. Joe fans were like, ah, a new bigger scale, I'm not going to collect this. And they ultimately didn't, because it really didn't fit with anything else. Uh, one of the benefits of G.I. Joe Classified series being 6 inches, there's a ton of 6 inch action figure lines on the market for them to go with. But G.I. Joe Sigma 6 is a nostalgia point for many. And the reason for that is because Sigma 6 had an animated series airing from 2005 to 2006 for 26 episodes, and it was produced by 4Kids Entertainment, who were pretty much the leading distributors of anime to kids' time slots. This series was an original series produced for four kids by anime studio Gonzo. And that means it had that anime flair, that anime styling, and certainly that four kids dubbing. And if you were watching Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh, you can watch this show and go, hey, there's Dan Green, there's Eric Stewart, or there's Kaiba, there's Brock. You know, you had, you had your options. There's a lot of the actors are the same from the other four kids productions. Now, unfortunately, it wasn't as successful as their attempt with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, probably because going full anime was enough of a departure from classic G.I. Joe styling that the existing fans just checked out. Uh, there's another story like this for He-Man and the Master of the Universe in the 2000s, which we'll talk about someday on this channel. But in terms of getting a new audience, it seemed to gain an audience, because I know a lot of people that have nostalgia for Sigma-6, but it sort of didn't get enough of an audience because G.I. Joe went back into Hibernation Zone after the release of this series. Now, this show itself is actually streaming on the G.I. Joe YouTube. I believe it's also on Tubi. It's never had a full video release on DVD, though I do think there was like a sampler DVD at some point. It kicks off with a five-parter, so they're definitely trying to channel the Sunbow series. And it's very 4Kids 2000s, and if you can't handle 4Kids 2000s, it may not be the show for you. Now, also, despite being produced by Japanese anime studio Gonzo, there's no Japanese language version to my knowledge, so it kind of exists as a weird little anomaly, I think that Sigma-6 was a big point for many. 
Now, the reason why Sigma-6 is in this chapter of the video and not its own is because it actually is a sequel to Valor vs. Venom. It's one of the things that nobody really talks about, but Spy Troops had a sequel, Valor vs. Venom, and Valor vs. Venom has a sequel, Sigma-6. The actual opening episode references events that happened in Valor vs. Venom. Some characters, like Overkill, who was really big in Valor vs. Venom, are big characters in Sigma-6. So if you're watching Sigma-6, you can jump in right into the show, but I recommend checking out Spy Troops and Valor vs. Venom to kind of get the backstory on this universe. Though unfortunately Sigma-6 would be the end of it, it kind of works as a trilogy of two movies and a 26-episode TV show, which, hey, that's a pretty long-running continuity for G.I. Joe. Second longest-running continuity after the original Sunbow cartoon. Yeah, that was spoilers for the rest of the video, this is the longest-running thing G.I. Joe had ever. But let's go on to the rest of the G.I. Joe lineup. <laughs> Now in 2008, another relaunch of G.I. Joe. This time aimed at its older fans, the fans they chased off with Sigma-6 being too different, G.I. Joe Resolute, a series of 10 5-minute shorts and one 10-minute short compiled into a movie. This was a darker, more mature, TV-14 rated animated film that was chopped into segments for online distribution. G.I. Joe Resolute is a bit of a shock to the system, considering all prior G.I. Joe media pretty much straight away from the concept of death, and this one starts with a bloody massacre at the beginning. Uh, nice. Now, the thing is, the uh, G.I. Joe Resolute kind of has an infamous, like, oh, it's the super gritty, like, G.I. Joe, rawr thing. But I actually think it improves after that initial shock of the violence. There's a lot of cool ideas and a lot of cool things presented here, and it was supposed to, I think, kind of reinvigorate G.I. Joe a little bit, maybe aim it at an older audience, since aiming at a younger audience apparently didn't work out for them. Now, finding G.I. Joe Resolute isn't too hard. There was a DVD of the movie compilation of the, uh, of the animation, which is pretty cool, and you can find it on the G.I. Joe YouTube channel if you look it up, which I think makes it really accessible. If you're somebody who likes a little bit more mature storytelling, a little bit darker themes, go try G.I. Joe Resolute. It may hit you better than an 80s cartoon, which was my first recommendation, or a 2000s cartoon produced by four kids, like with Sigma-6. It depends on what you're into. This has a similar tone to a lot of the early DC Universe direct-to-video animated movies and actually features some of the similar staff. So if you like those, if you liked Superman Doomsday or you liked some of the earlier films, it's kind of in line with those. Uh, Batman Under the Red Hood would be a good comparison. It's fun, it's just standalone, and that's the only bummer, because I would have liked to have seen this continued in some way. So just like it had been in the 80s, where Transformers copied G.I. Joe's formula to bring success to both, G.I. Joe was copying Transformers formula with the 2009 film G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra. See, the Transformers 2007 film was so successful, they already like fast-tracked a sequel with Revenge of the Fallen, and they also put out G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra to give it the same treatment. It did not work out. Because the thing is that while the movie was successful enough to get a sequel, this movie series did not prove to be as successful as the Transformers movie series. Whatever special sauce was missing for the general audience just wasn't here in this movie. And personally speaking, this is not very G.I. Joe-like. They have a lot of the elements and a lot of the characters are there, but it's presented very much like, hey, it's the military guys from the Transformers movie where they're military guys and that's their one personality trait. And so that was kind of off-putting to some G.I. Joe fans. Personally speaking, this turned me off G.I. Joe for many years, and I had to come back to it like six years later to really hype myself up again. Yeah, rough times. But if you are looking for something in a modern 2000s-style military action film, G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra might be up your alley. Uh, that being said, it is not quite loved in the fandom, so be wary. If you do love this movie, you may get some hostile takes from some people. Not from me, because I welcome all kinds of opinions, but it's not super loved. That being said, it did get a sequel. In 2013, we got G.I. Joe Retaliation. Uh, this was supposed to be in 2012, but they delayed the movie to get a 3D version made because that was all the rage, and that was bad because all the toys were sold, gone, clearanced out before the movie even came out, and it had been a few too many years since Rise of Cobra. 
Now this film, I personally like a lot better. It's my personal favorite live action G.I. Joe movie. And I actually recommend just watching this over Rise of Cobra if you want like that live action G.I. Joe flair. And the reason why is because while it does connect to things in Rise of Cobra, it did feel like a bit of a reset in a lot of ways. I really, really like this movie. It has one of my favorite action sequences of all time in it. Uh, there's a extended action scene taking place on a mountain and I, I watch it, just that one scene sometimes. It's incredible. And I think that's what makes this fun. It has a smaller core cast. It gives the Joes personality. It gives the Cobra personality. It has one of the coolest Cobra Commander designs. I can't recommend this movie enough if you've never seen it because I think it's kind of like, it's not quite like pure G.I. Joe, but it feels like a G.I. Joe movie in a way that Rise of Cobra didn't. And I think that's kind of a good distinction to have. So Rise of Cobra Retaliation being modern Paramount Pictures films, they're available on streaming. They're available on DVD, Blu-ray, and they're available on 4K Blu-ray. Now, with G.I. Joe Retaliation, there is an extended cut. Uh, it adds a few more minutes to the movie. And if you get the 4K Steelbook, it includes it. But if you get the standard 4K like this, it doesn't include the extended cut, and you'll have to look for it. There is a separate standalone release that is the extended cut. It's called the Extended Action Cut. I do recommend picking that up. It just adds, like, you know, another five minutes to the movie, a little bit more personality and character scenes to it. It's a good thing to have. But that is the two movies. It didn't continue forward because Retaliation was a big flop. And that was kind of the end of that G.I. Joe movie timeline. Now let's talk about one that makes me sad. Uh, G.I. Joe Renegades came out in 2012 off the heels of Transformers Prime. See, Hasbro had done this deal with Discovery where they had the Hub Network, which was kind of supposed to be a hub of multiple shows, but a lot of Hasbro properties, and they created original programming for it, including the well-regarded Transformers Prime and G.I. Joe Renegades, which was, again, trying to keep G.I. Joe and Transformers moving at the same pace. Everyone's got movies, everyone's got TV shows. Now, G.I. Joe Renegades takes a different approach to G.I. Joe. It's actually done as a giant homage to the A-Team. The G.I. Joe team are fugitives from the government, and they're trying to take apart the Cobra plot from inside everything. There's a lot of serialized storytelling, a lot of great character work, really cool animation, and overall just a really well-presented animated series. It lasted 26 episodes for one season. Why was G.I. Joe Renegades cancelled? Because Hasbro wanted to focus their efforts on G.I. Joe Retaliation, and they had created differences with the showrunner versus what they wanted to do. This is a common theme that comes up where Hasbro TV shows are kind of just fillers for the next movie, and Renegades fell the same fate. And it's just a bummer, because I think the show had a great thing going for it. It's still a good show, I do recommend watching it, though it does have a cliffhanger ending, like a lot of cancelled shows in the 2010s. A real bummer that kept happening. But if you are looking for the series, it is on the G.I. Joe YouTube channel. It is on Tubi. It is available on DVD and is available on Blu-ray, but those, those are out of print, so mileage may vary when looking for them. But if you're wanting to look for it, it's on two free platforms, Tubi and YouTube. I would recommend checking this out. In fact, if you've never seen G.I. Joe, might be a great introduction to things. I think this is another good introductory point. And I really like the show, and I wish it would have continued, and it's kind of a bummer that it didn't. Uh, once again, that Spy Troops to, to Sigma-6 era was really like the long-running thing that we didn't get anywhere else. And then that brings us to 2021's Snake Eyes, G.I. Joe Origins. So this was the second attempt at a live-action G.I. Joe movie series. Uh, it is a complete reboot. It is not connected to Rise of Cobra Retaliation whatsoever. It is an origin story for Snake Eyes, giving him a completely brand new backstory with absolutely no connection to the backstories given in other G.I. Joe media, such as the original G.I. Joe Real American Hero comic by Larry Hama. It has a lot of uh, things in it that people don't like. It's sort of made like an action film, a martial arts action film by the guys that did the raid, and it sort of lacks in the G.I. Joe and Cobra-ness. It kind of soft launches a new version of G.I. Joe and Cobra, and I think it's a really interesting idea. But this movie didn't click, it didn't hit. Sure, it came out at a rough time for Hollywood, but that's like the whole time from 2020 to now. But it didn't click with people, and I think that was because they kind of made too many fundamental changes to the character of Snake Eyes. Sometimes you don't need to have an origin for something. Kind of like how I don't think we needed to have the origin for Cobra we did in Rise of Cobra. 
It was a misstep. It didn't work out. As far as we know, this universe of G.I. Joe is not continuing. It was just this one movie. It was, of course, available on 4K Blu-ray. DVD is available on streaming on Paramount Plus and YouTube currently as a time of recording. It's out there. It's not hard to find a modern film on uh, any streaming service at this point. Now, that being said, there is one good thing about the Snake Eyes movie. It got us G.I. Joe classified as a toy line. That toy line only existed because they were doing a movie, but because it was so popular and successful, they've kept G.I. Joe classified going for five years now, and it continues to get better and better and better. And sometimes that's the way that things have to work out. You may not have liked a certain movie or show, but it led you to get something you did like, and that's kind of the fun of franchises. Now, other future potential things for G.I. Joe include a possible Transformers and G.I. Joe crossover movie coming up in development. They have a writer, they're working on getting a director. It seems to be the third Transformers movie after Bumblebee and Rise of the Beasts, but it may also be a crossover with G.I. Joe, as G.I. Joe was teased within Transformers Rise of the Beasts. And I think that's a cool idea because if you're going to try to soft launch G.I. Joe off the back of Transformers, why not soft launch it off of an integrated universe with Transformers? Speaking of which, I know we're talking about movies and shows, but I really got to talk about the Energon universe. So I did a full video introducing the Energon universe, and I'd recommend go checking that out for more details. But right now, the combined Transformers and G.I. Joe comic book universe, known as the Energon universe, is absolutely the best entry point to G.I. Joe I can recommend at this moment. Because, while my other recommendations are, I think, solid. See, because the other recommendations I have for starting points, I think, are pretty solid. Like, Larry Hama's G.I. Joe comic. It's legendary, but it is over 300 issues, and that can be daunting, and it did start in the 80s. Though, while I think you could jump in at any point, pick up any issue of it, because he writes issue by issue, sort of not planning things out in the long term, but just going one issue at a time, you can jump in at any time. But they are reprinting that series from the beginning in new paperback compendiums or hardcover compendiums if you got in on the Kickstarter. The thing is that that comic is being more available. My second recommendation being the Mass Device five-parter from the 80s is still an 80s cartoon and maybe off-putting to modern audiences. And I do think Renegades being a one-season show that ends on a cliffhanger could also be a rough recommendation as well. So I'm going to recommend Duke and Cobra Commander. The two comic books by Joshua Williamson with different artists on them are great starting points into the Energon universe. And if you're a Transformers fan, both comics exist in a world where the Transformers came to Earth and G.I. Joe and Cobra are formed as a response to that happening. And that, I think, is such a cool idea we've never truly seen before. We've never seen Transformers and G.I. Joe in the same universe from the beginning. And so I think that is great. It's continued into the excellent Scarlet series and what looks to be a great Destro series. There's going to be these miniseries, five-issue miniseries, connecting the G.I. Joe and Cobra characters maybe eventually leading to their own comic with the individual teams. But you're getting a lot of great character development, you're getting a lot of slow introduction to characters, and I think it's a great place to go if you're looking into G.I. Joe and you don't mind reading comic books. Of course, we've got those other recommendations for movies and shows, but I think this is the best place to start because it feels the most newcomer-friendly. And yeah, it's built off the back of Transformers, but Transformers is built off the back of G.I. Joe, so everything comes full circle. So that does it for my G.I. Joe viewing guide. I hope I've made some sense of things, and I hope that you're out there looking for G.I. Joe and hoping for some recommendations. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions or concerns, please leave them in the comments. Uh, I know sometimes things can be confusing. I know sometimes streaming services split up the G.I. Joe miniseries. That's why I wanted to mention them specifically separate from the original Sunbow cartoon. I really wanted to make this easy to find things. G.I. Joe has not had the best track record in its adapted media to TV, but at least there is enough stuff out there and enough variety that I hope you'll find something you enjoy. Or you can try, try some stuff and not like any of it, but still collect classified because they're cool toys. That's totally valid, too. I just think that this was the right time to do it with the anniversary of G.I. Joe, with Hasbro doing Yo Joe June. I thought, why not do my own little celebration of G.I. Joe? So if you enjoyed this, like I said, please hit the like button if you haven't already. Hit subscribe and the notification bell if you haven't already. Helps the channel grow. Helps the video get out to more people. And share this around to friends that may be trying to find a way into G.I. Joe media that they haven't been able to find yet. If you enjoy listening to me talk, check out our live streams on this YouTube channel every Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern. We talk about G.I. Joe news, we talk about toy news, and comic news, and Blu-ray news, and all kinds of fun stuff. We Everything we cover on the channel, we talk about the news for it on those live streams, so come hang out. 
Also join our Discord server in the link below. There is a lot of resources down there, a lot of great people, a lot of great knowledge. Come in there, hang out, talk, share, have fun, enjoy what fandom should be. Also be sure to check out the channel memberships if you want to help support the channel directly to fund more videos like this. You can get perks like early access to videos, special shout outs, and member exclusive live streams. Now let's give a special shout out to some of our channel members. Special shout out to our channel members including our Captain Tears, Spin-54, Super Shadix Boom, Toma K, Jamie's World, Masterbin95, Princeton Phalanx59, It's La Dorman, Matthias Lara, K Breezy, Sentai Ranger Donnie, Ray Venkman, Common Jojo, Scotty Z70, Oma Ender, Marvel Fan, Dr. Grid, Brendan Overland, ARG and Marco27, Jeremy Carr, Smith the Crow, and thank you everyone for your continued support of the channel. If you'd like to find me on social media, you can find me across most platforms at SoundOut12. You can find my wonderful graphic designer on social media and Discord at DarkClaw643. Plus you can find Hero Club at Hero-Club.com for news, interviews, reviews, and more. And until next time, this is SoundOut saying, Yo Joe!